It is uh, indeed a pleasure to introduce you to an individual who has contributed greatly to the body of research and literature within the social sciences. Um, originally from Carroll in Western Iowa, uh, Dr. Rogers attended Iowa State University and uh, received his degree, his PhD that is, in 1957 in uh, sociology. And to uh, note, I was actually very pleased to find out and to discover this morning that his undergraduate work is also done here at Iowa State in uh, my home department, or one of my home departments, I should say, agricultural education. Uh, Everett Rogers is certainly, without question, a specialist in research and teaching in the area of uh, diffusion of innovations, and has published many works in this area, including the popular text, uh, Diffusion of Innovations, which was originally published in 1962. Early in his career, he went on to uh, to um, investigate the diffusion of agricultural innovations among farmers in Iowa and Ohio, and uh, since 1963 has done the same in Brazil, Colombia, Nigeria, and in India. In the 80s, he uh, investigated the um, adoption, excuse me, and impacts of a new video text uh, service called the Green Thumb Box and this was done among Kentucky farmers. And most recently, he is synthesizing research in the area of, um, of um, application of microcomputers in third world agricultural development. Upon his receiving his degree from Iowa State in 1957, he went on to teach at Ohio State University, the National University of Columbia in Bogota, Michigan State University, University of Michigan, and Stanford University until uh, 1985, where he moved to uh, the prestigious Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Southern California. I'd also like to, uh, you to note that he is currently serving as a member of CCARD's International Advisory Board. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to Iowa State University, Dr. Everett Rogers. especially nice to be uh, back here. Uh, it's like a study in social change itself. Uh, being, I've been gone for 12 years uh, since I've been back in Ames, and uh, many things are the same. Uh, some things are different. Uh, some people are not here who were, uh, like Jean. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but many things are the same. I noticed the snow fence uh, in front of Curtis Hall uh, when I uh, I walked over there this morning, and uh, I can remember a controversy that I used to be part of. When I was an undergraduate, uh, somehow uh, my residence group elected me to the student governing body, which was then called Cardinal Guild. Is it still called Cardinal Guild? Some things don't change. Uh, Cardinal Guild had its detractors in the student body, uh, especially on the part of the editor of the Stanford Daily. His name was Don Mum. Uh, so he used to call it Chickadee Guild instead of Cardinal Guild, uh, referring to the petty issues with which we dealt. In any event, uh, as a member of uh, that so-called student governing uh, organization, I was uh, deputed to represent the student body on a faculty committee that was in charge of uh, grass and trees. Actually, it was a, a committee that sought to seek a contra compromise between the grass and trees issues, uh, trying to keep Iowa State the most beautiful uh, university campus uh, in the United States, uh, versus people who wanted more parking lots. These were mostly students. Students were beginning to get cars in uh, 1950, and uh, we thought that we needed a place to park them on campus. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, people in charge of uh, parking and uh, the head of the landscape architecture department uh, people like these faculty members were on this committee and there was a lot of controversy and one of the big issues of that day were student paths. Uh, these were not faculty paths, these were student paths. Faculty never walked on these paths, we believed in those days, uh, and these were trails through the grass uh, destroying, of course, the beauty of the campus. Uh, well, uh, I believe that we came up with uh, at least what was then a temporary solution to this controversy on the committee. Uh, we had uh, uh, someone take a photograph of the uh, campus uh, late in the afternoon, while there were shadows, uh, after about a two-foot snowstorm. 
uh, and uh, so students have been walking, uh, and even some faculty members might have been walking, uh, and so we then overlaid a uh, map of the sidewalk structure of the campus on top of that photograph, and we could see where there weren't sidewalks, and then those sidewalks uh, were built. I believe this must have been an early example of the use of indigenous knowledge, uh, knowledge expressed through our feet uh, through the snow uh, that day. The important textbook, the first main textbook in statistical methods, uh, called Statistical Methods. Well, uh, all of these things were said by Mahabalus, and it was very nice of him, made us all feel very good, warm on a cold Iowa night. And then after a few seconds pause, he said, um, in 1725 BC, uh, the great Indian mathematician Rao invented the zero. And uh, then he went on with the history of uh, early math and stat, uh, never working up to uh, the time of Christ. Uh, afterwards, uh, a group of us, uh, friends, uh, doctoral students, uh, walked over here uh, from Curtis Assembly to the Union to have a cup of coffee before we went home to Palmer Court. And I remember uh, I was holding out for the fact that Mahabalus really wasn't real, that uh, Snedeker had sent over to Central Casting and uh, had them send over someone who spoke uh, and looked like an Indian uh, to play the role of Mahabalus and to create this the silliness about the fact that math and stat had existed even before the time of Christ. Later, of course, I, I knew more, I learned more about history and uh, uh, learned that indeed that was Mahabalus and I've even learned how famous Mahabalus uh, was uh, and that everything he was saying was exactly uh, correct. I guess the point there is sometimes it helps to uh, know a little history to be taught a little history. Uh, now uh, skip up to uh, about that time, also 1956. At that time I was doing, uh, gathering some data in Collins, Iowa. I was uh, with some uh, other scholars interviewing uh, 156 uh, farmers, all of the farmers that lived in the Collins community. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Collins is, it's about 20 or 25 miles from here in Story County. Uh, and it was uh, selected as a somewhat typical uh, Iowa corn hog uh, uh, community. I was studying, uh, this eventually became my dissertation, I was studying the adoption of 20 agricultural innovations, uh, things like uh, diethyl stubestrol for cattle feeding, uh, 2,4-D weed spray, uh, antibiotics for hog feeding, uh, <coughs> nitrogen, the use of nitrogen fertilizer on corn, uh, and uh, many farmers had adopted many of these innovations. I, I got this list from uh, agricultural extension specialists uh, here uh, at Iowa State, and they were, th uh, we thought, they were the 20 most important agricultural innovations that were uh, diffusing in the 1950s. Uh, now I encountered one farmer that I interviewed in Collins who uh, had not adopted any of these 20 innovations. He was the most laggardly farmer in my sample, and uh, I, uh, of course, uh, asked him why he hadn't adopted any of these innovations, and he said that he had noticed that his farmers, uh, this neighbors, the neighbor farmers' fields, uh, had uh, very few earthworms uh, compared to his fields, and uh, he greatly valued his earthworms, and uh, he thought that the earthworms were a good thing for the crops that he raised, and uh, thus he had nothing to do with uh, any kind of agricultural chemicals or even more broadly with any of the new agricultural scientific innovations that were then uh, diffusing. Naturally, in my study, I categorized him as a laggard, the most laggardly of my laggards, in fact. Uh, in reality, in another uh, era, we have come to see that he was perhaps the most innovative of all the farmers. Uh, in fact, he was uh, the only organic farmer. We didn't use those terms at that time, but uh, he was the first and most innovative of the uh, organic farmers uh, in the Collins community. Uh, today, we know that those farmers make up about 20% of all of our farmers and gardeners in America. Uh, we know that uh, agricultural research workers have turned their attention uh, now, and for some years, in fact, to the problems of uh, organic uh, farmers and uh, of, uh, gardeners. Uh, it is, of course, a sign of the times that uh, downstairs, when I came out of the bookstore and the commons where I purchased an Iowa State Cyclone t-shirt for a little effort, 
Uh, I've found myself um, talking with people from the Vegetarian Society of Central Iowa, and uh, they, in fact, gave me some of their literature. These are certainly signs of the times um, at uh, Iowa State, and it is, of course, the uh, growing number of vegetarians uh, in our society that make the extra high prices for organically grown uh, fruits, uh, vegetables, and other products. Um, but the two movements are uh, totally linked. Now, one more story, and then I'll get down to serious business. Uh, this is something that happened in 1966 <clears throat> uh, on the occasion of uh, my first visit to ERI, the International Rice Research Institute uh, in the Philippines. <coughs> Iowa State has had a very strong influence uh, on ERI and on the other C-card centers uh, around the world, as is only appropriate. Uh, in any event, I was asked to give a talk uh, at uh, ERI to, uh, to the people who work there in the Erie Auditorium. Uh, and at this time, uh, 1966, IR-8 and IR-20, the first two of uh, the Erie varieties, uh, were uh, had spread, and we were finding in the diffusion study that we were doing in India at that time, uh, in West Godavari District, a rice bowl district uh, on, uh, in eastern India. We were finding that uh, two or three percent of the farmers were already growing these new varieties, IR8 and IR20. <clears throat> and indeed, uh, they were tripling, doubling at least, and in some cases tripling their rice yields by planting these uh, new varieties. They were also using pesticides and fertilizers and uh, planting the seeds more closely and uh, irrigating. Uh, so they were doing other things along with the new varieties to get these uh, unbelievable yields. Uh, however, we were also finding that people, uh, the Indian farm people, uh, did not like the taste of uh, IRI IR8 and IR20. Uh, and indeed, uh, on the local markets, uh, in the bazaars, um, uh, the miracle varieties, the rice, uh, IR20 and IR8, uh, were selling for about 20% uh, below the market price of uh, the locally grown uh, varieties. And indeed, these innovative farmers who were planting the new varieties uh, were also still planting some of the old varieties, which they were, in fact, using for their own consumption and selling the uh, Erie uh, rice. Uh, well, I mentioned this uh, in my uh, talk about the diffusion of uh, uh, the Erie uh, varieties, a uh, diffusion process that was then just beginning. Uh, and at that time, uh, I'd, of course, been given a tour of Erie the morning before my talk that afternoon, and uh, I was uh, shown these splendid facilities and uh, uh, was very impressed by what was going on. Uh, and I had inquired about the uh, factors for which the new varieties were being bred. And at that time, this was 1966, there were four main uh, varieties, uh, four main factors in the breeding for the new varieties. Uh, short straw, high yield, uh, nitrogen absorbing ability, and a short growing period, <clears throat> all very sensible. Uh, genetic uh, rice uh, factors to breed for, uh, not, I was told, for taste. And in fact, uh, when I mentioned in my lecture that afternoon at Erie that uh, there might be some problems with the acceptance of the Erie varieties, uh, in some countries at least, uh, on the basis of uh, taste, the Erie director, who was sitting in the front row, um, uh, said, um, what uh, in my mind sort of became one of the mottos of Erie. Uh, he said two words. The second one was taste, and the first one was a four-letter word that begins with F and ends in K. And uh, it showed uh, a certain disdain for uh, taste. His opinion was that uh, if these varieties uh, increased food supplies enough, we didn't need to worry about people eating the rice. They would eventually learn to like the taste of the new varieties. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, today, uh, when we go back to Erie, uh, 25 years later, uh, I notice that Erie is now breeding for taste. Uh, and it has been for many years, in fact. Uh, the IR varieties are very widely used uh, throughout the world, uh, except in Bali. We'll hear more about that later. Uh, but uh, in January, when I visited uh, India the last time, 
uh, a month or two ago, I uh, went to a local market and uh, priced rice, and I found there was a two-price system, and uh, the Erie varieties, the Miracle varieties, were still selling for about 20% less than the uh, uh, Desi varieties, the Indian uh, varieties, the non-Erie uh, varieties. I, I felt a certain sense of satisfaction, certainly with the fact that now uh, Erie is breeding for taste. Uh, now, um, some general points, and I'm going to be drawing on these uh, little ex examples that I've just mentioned. Uh, it is useful, I think, uh, to think of eras of development uh, communication. Uh, some of these were mentioned in the uh, noon lecture by my colleague uh, Thierry Bardini, uh, and many of you have uh, read about them and discussed them, uh, so I'm going to uh, say very little about the uh, first two, but concentrate on the present era. Uh, the first era was perhaps that of the 1950s uh, and 60s, and uh, it was an optimistic era um, I was part of that optimism. I'm talking about my own career here, uh, my own eras as well, those of conventional wisdom. Uh, this was the time of uh, Daniel Lerner's book, uh, which was, I believe, published in 1958, on the passing of, called The Passing of Traditional Society, Modernizing the Middle East. It was also uh, the time of Wilbur Schramm's important book, 1964, uh, Mass Media and National Development. This was the time at which uh, we were experiencing what we then called the transistor revolution, the transistor radio revolution. Radios had suddenly become small and uh, cheap and uh, plentiful. Uh, Catholic priests in Colombia, which is where I was then doing some of the first studies that I did of diffusion and development in the third world, well, that was actually in 1963, uh, radios, uh, Phillips radios, uh, were then selling for $4.50 U.S. And U.S. dollars. Uh, so uh, radios were popping up uh, all over the place. Uh, but uh, this was an era of uh, great optimism about what communication could do in development, for development. It was a period of one-way communication. It was assumed that uh, government planners uh, and uh, technological experts, technical people, knew what was best for the people and that the problem was to transmit the information from the experts who had it to the public who didn't have it but would use it if they knew about it. Uh, it was also a period of food crises. Uh, the Indian food crisis of, uh, of uh, 1959 was a very serious one indeed. About uh, uh, India was short about 20 percent of food grains and uh, uh, a team was sent uh, to India of outsiders to make some recommendations, uh, one of whom was George Beale from, uh, from Iowa State, uh, my advisor in, uh, who, who had been my advisor in grad work. So we shouldn't forget that food was in very short supply uh, in some countries back in this period. And it was thought that that problem of uh, food shortage uh, and other problems of development uh, would now, could now be met uh, or in part met by uh, the use, the harnessing of communication, and radio looked so promising because it could, as we used to say, leap over the literacy barrier, the illiteracy barrier. Uh, PCI, per capita income, was the measure of uh, economic development. It was economic development. Actually, it was economic growth, uh, and that was our main measure, and that is what we thought development was. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, let's say, uh, the second era of the 1970s, one of questioning uh, what we had thought was so certain in the 50s and 60s, uh, we began to uh, question whether PCI, per capita income, was the best uh, measure of development. Uh, we thought it wasn't uh, all of development, at least. Uh, we also didn't see very much increase in per capita income uh, in most third world countries, uh, with the exception of a few showcase countries like Korea and Mexico, for instance. Uh, this was the time of the opening of China uh, to the U.S. and to much of the rest of the world. And uh, here we saw a nation with a very different development approach. Uh, and uh, many scholars went there, as I did, and tried to uh, see what lessons could be learned for, uh, for us. Uh, this was also a time, the questioning period, of over-urbanization. Uh, you could name almost any big city in almost any third world country, and in fact, almost any nation, any, any large city in any nation, uh, and observe tremendous uh, problems of um, environmental pollution. 
Uh, this was also, of course, the time of the first environmental crisis. And we began to wonder whether, um, whether uh, technological innovations in agriculture to unemploy a farm workforce, uh, which was then to migrate to cities, uh, work in factories, uh, was the best route to development. Uh, but uh, so this was a period of uh, questioning. Well, out of that questioning is w here we are today in what is another optimistic era, uh, hopefully a better informed optimistic era, one in which we build on some of these previous lessons learned, uh, lessons learned by uh, development scholars like the many here at Iowa State and uh, those from uh, outside uh, like Niels Rowling and Janice Jiggers who have come to uh, also share this occasion and to speak to you uh, tomorrow. I think it is tomorrow, isn't it? Uh, I'm sorry that my classes, uh, my students, they think that if they pay me, I should be there to teach them tomorrow, so I, that's why I have to go tonight. Now, why this new optimism? Uh, if I'm right in calling this a new optimism, uh, I think there are several reasons, and uh, one of these is new communication technologies. Uh, this is a period, uh, the last decade, basically, in which we've come to see that we can do some things with communication satellites that are useful for development. Uh, satellites basically remove the cost of distance in communication. And for many purposes, that is a very important uh, quality that comes at, of course, a very huge price. Uh, satellites don't come very cheaply. Uh, it is those satellites, uh, one of their uses, their uses uh, for television transmission that um, have enabled uh, CNN to spread throughout the world to 100 countries as it claims to be. Uh, but it has also uh, greatly increased the number of television sets and tremendously increased the television audience in third world uh, countries. Uh, today, uh, about half of all television sets are in third world countries and that's up from about 10% uh, in 1980. So we've seen uh, a, a huge change in uh, the size of the television audience uh, in the world uh, in the last 10 years. It must go down as one of the most massive changes in at least access uh, to a communication technology that the world has ever seen. Uh, making up an important part of that change has been the case of China because Republic of China, where uh, in a survey that uh, we did in uh, China in uh, 1980, uh, we found about 5% of, uh, of people uh, were in the television audience. Uh, that is, uh, they said they had watched television the day before. They did not all have their own television sets by any means. Uh, now that is uh, today, uh, up to 85 or 90 percent, and that's 85 or 90 percent of 1.1 billion people, so that is, uh, represents a tremendous uh, number of people. Uh, India, a case that I've been uh, studying for many years, uh, is also quite spectacular. Uh, an increase there from a couple of percent uh, in 1984, as recently as 1984, to uh, about 15 percent, 15 percent. Uh, today, and that's 15% of 90 million people, so it's about 135 million people. Uh, India then has roughly increased the size of its television audience in the last uh, seven years uh, by uh, approximately the number of regular television viewers that we have in a typical day in America. Uh, Mexico and Brazil are other spectacular cases where uh, the television audience, that is people who say they watched television yesterday when asked, uh, represent uh, about 90 percent of the population. Uh, there are other countries in which almost no one has access to television, uh, so uh, this uh, television audience is still concentrated in a relatively modest number of uh, very large population countries that are also very large in land area, and one reason uh, for uh, the spread of television is because uh, a signal can be received and that's mainly due to satellite transmission to ground stations that then retransmit it uh, in the surrounding area. So satellites uh, have uh, helped, among other things, uh, greatly increase the television audience. Uh, a problem remains of what is shown on television. I'll get to that point in a minute. Uh, Microcomputers, uh, which we heard a great deal about this noon, um, another uh, technology not yet very widely used 
uh, but increasingly used in uh, some crucial uses uh, um, about a pattern of use very different from that found among Iowa farmers where uh, uh, Eric uh, is finding uh, something like 20% of Iowa farmers that have um, microcomputers today and I believe if I understood right about 10% who have uh, DBS direct product broadcast satellite uh, dishes. Um, video, uh, another uh, technology that's uh, spreading widely in some areas, uh, in some parts of the third world. Uh, we know of Middle Eastern countries, uh, some of those which have been prominently in the news in recent months, uh, in which uh, maybe 90 or 95 percent of all households have at least one uh, VCR. There are certain reasons of culture and of family patterns and of other aspects that explain that phenomenally high rate of uh, VCR adoption. It's something like 75 percent in the United States today. In some European countries, a couple of them, it's like the Middle East. In, in some other countries, it's much, much less. Uh, in any event, what are people seeing on uh, video? Well, mostly they're seeing old films. Uh, sometimes they're seeing old TV shows. Uh, but sometimes, and this is increasing, they're seeing uh, instructional television. And sometimes uh, sorry, they're seeing instructional video sh shows on their VCRs. And sometimes, in some countries now, we see this new pattern of uh, news programs, uh, so news magazines with uh, a, a videotape of um, sort of inside news, the kind that one doesn't see in a government-controlled television system, uh, um, with a service being sold. So it's like being, buying a monthly news magazine, except it's on video. Uh, so these are some of the technologies which are, uh, I think, involved in the uh, optimism of the current era. How those technologies are applied and what their content then becomes a second matter. Uh, I think uh, that we have only really begun to focus on the content of the messages that are transmitted by these uh, technologies. Um, I've been involved, uh, for instance, in a series of uh, studies, first in Latin America, and now in Asia, other scholars have been studying this phenomena in Europe and in other parts of the world on uh, television exporting and, uh, and importing. Uh, to explain it in one way, uh, the U.S. television industry, uh, the part of the industry that produces television programs, most of which is in my hometown, I don't mean Carroll, I mean the other, the place I now live, uh, where my garden now is. Uh, not where my farm is, where my garden is. Uh, but uh, the U.S. television industry uh, earns about uh, half of its total earnings today from international sales and through a sort of weird accounting practice uh, that is widely used throughout the world by television and film industries. Uh, the foreign sales are counted as almost uh, uh, completely profit. So all costs are charged against domestic production and then uh, the same product is sold overseas, uh, and in an accounting <coughs> sense, it's considered pure profit. So if you look at where the profit comes from in the U.S. television industry, it almost all comes from overseas sales. Uh, it looked at another way, if you look at the uh, typical television broadcasting schedule in the typical country in the third world today, while there's tremendous variation from country to country, uh, roughly uh, today, about a third of the program hours are, uh, are imported programming, and about 85 percent of the imported programming is imported uh, from the United States. Uh, I, I'm not uh, saying that is good news. I'm saying that's terribly bad news. Uh, in most cases, the imported programming is uh, the worst of violent uh, U.S. television fare uh, with a heavy dose of I Love Lucy, uh, in any event, this is certainly not pro-development uh, content. Uh, the other kind of uh, content that uh, dominates this growing television audience, for instance, in addition to imported programming, uh, is locally produced uh, entertainment uh, content. Uh, typically, these are soap operas. Uh, in Latin America, it is lots of soap operas. Uh, and in other parts of the world, uh, increasingly, it is soap operas, game shows, uh, entertainment, things to uh, take people's minds into fantasy. I'm not opposed to that. Uh, but uh, if that's all we see on television, I'm wondering if it's helping us that uh, we have such a rapidly increasing television audience. 
Certainly nothing wrong with entertainment being the bait that convinces people to uh, invest in a television set and to attend to it. Uh, but then if they don't see anything that uh, helps them with their main problems of their lives, uh, any development information, it would seem the ultimate in futility. It would seem something like building a tremendous scaffold and then forgetting to build a building inside of it. Uh, hopefully, uh, fortunately and hopefully, uh, that idea has appeared uh, and been implemented by a number of uh, very important people in recent years. Uh, starting in about 1977, uh, a Mexican uh, television uh, and theatrical producer and director and scriptwriter named uh, Miguel Sabido has uh, uh, created a series of, uh, of uh, soap operas uh, broadcast in Spanish, uh, broadcast to very large audiences throughout Latin America. Uh, these are entertainment uh, soap operas, but with educational messages embedded uh, in them. Each of them, in fact, are organized around one main educational idea, uh, adult literacy, actually enrollment in uh, adult literacy classes uh, in his first soap opera, family planning in another one, uh, gender equality in uh, another, uh, child abuse, uh, discouraging people from abusing their children, of course, being the theme in yet another of his soap operas. Uh, his idea then, uh, after some lag, uh, was taken up and adapted first in India in 1984-85 in uh, what I think is a very important uh, educational soap opera called Hamlog, uh, We People, the story of a lower middle class urban family uh, in living in a slum in Delhi. Um, there are ten main characters from grandpa, grandmother, down through mother, father, uh, to the children, and then some of the children, of course, uh, getting married. So it was a multi-generational household, a typical Indian household. The educational theme uh, was uh, that of family planning, uh, family equality, and hit much less heavily um, a gender equality. There were uh, sort of good guys and bad guys in Hanlog, as there are in all of these entertainment education uh, soap operas. <coughs> Uh, one of the bad guys was the um, male head of the household who was uh, sort of a drunken, chauvinist pig who'd come home drunk and uh, abuse the uh, food that his wife had stayed up and prepared for him and, uh, and who would beat her. A real bad guy. Uh, he, of course, was punished, ultimately, in the soap opera. Uh, the uh, wife, this, uh, who was also a negative uh, role model because she stood for this, uh, she eventually uh, changed as the soap opera evolved and uh, developed uh, some of her own interests and became something other than just a Jewish mother for the family, something other than a doormat uh, serving her children and her husband and her older relatives. Uh, she enrolls in an adult education class, uh, takes up some interests of her own, and uh, begins to represent uh, the modern uh, Indian woman uh, that many people in India would like to see happen on a much larger basis. Uh, we did an evaluation study uh, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation of the effects of Humlog. And uh, one of the things we found uh, uh, is that uh, while most people understood the bad guys and the good guys and the bad guys that got converted to be good guys during the uh, 15 months that Humlog was broadcast, uh, a few people didn't catch on. This can always happen, uh, and I remember uh, one uh, um, middle-aged uh, uh, housewife uh, that we interviewed who uh, said um, if she could only find a girl like the negative role model, uh, the Jewish mother, uh, doormat character in, uh, in Hamlog, uh, for her son to marry. She says there aren't enough Indian girls uh, like that anymore. Well, I, I certainly agreed with her uh, about that. Uh, Humlog then uh, has led to uh, many other programs in various parts of the world, um, in uh, Jamaica, uh, Kenya, now underway, uh, a, a soap opera being produced along roughly similar lines, entertainment education, uh, in Nigeria, one in Botswana, uh, and uh, uh, one being broadcast now in Brazil, the real land of soap operas. 
so these are all um, uh, inspired by uh, this model, all make uh, appropriate modifications. Uh, there's nothing Mexican about Hanlog, uh, nor any of these other soap operas, but the basic idea of, uh, of motivating a vast audience uh, to certain types of social change and development uh, through um, an application, basically, of social learning theory, Bandura social learning theory, uh, uh, in the characters that are portrayed. Uh, just beginning its broadcast in India this month is uh, another educational soap opera, this one called Han Rehi, Rehi, Rahi, uh, which uh, deals with uh, female equality and attacks uh, the barbarous product, pra practice of, uh, of um, dowry deaths, as they are called, in which the bride is uh, soaked with kerosene and killed uh, by her uh, in-laws. Uh, so I'm sure we're going to hear more about Humrahi uh, before we're done. Uh, one doesn't need to do this with soap operas. It can be done with comics, comic books. It is being tried with comic books in Latin America today. The same idea of putting educational content in uh, entertainment programming. And uh, perhaps the greatest uh, singular success um, <clears throat> is that of a rock uh, music song uh, sung by uh, a male and female singer named uh, Tatiana and Johnny. Uh, Tatiana is a 17-year-old, well, she was, she's 19 now. She was a 17-year-old, uh, very beautiful uh, singer. Johnny is a Puerto Rican, uh, a graduate of Menudo, the rock uh, music group, and uh, they sing uh, this song which deals with um, teenage sexual abstinence. Uh, Don't do it is the message of the uh, song. Um, on the MTV version of it, they do a rather hip-grinding, sexy dance while they're singing these, song, this, these words <laughs> about uh, not doing it. It is sort of a mixed message. It was a uh, very popular uh, song. Uh, in Spanish, it, it was sung in Spanish, it's called um, Cuando Estemos Juntos, When We Are Together, uh, fairly clear what that means. Uh, and um, it was uh, for about six months played uh, an average of 15 times a day, one five, 15 times a day by the average um, Latin American radio station. You can see why we all got pretty sick of hearing this song about uh, sexual abstinence. In, in any event, um, Tatiana and Johnny made a nice piece of change. This is uh, education for profit. Um, the uh, Johns Hopkins University that was involved in making, designing at least, this uh, song and its performance uh, also made, everybody made money out of it. Uh, record companies made money out of it. And uh, a uh, communication scholar friend of mine um, in Mexico, uh, Ruben Hara, uh, who some of us remember, uh, did an evaluation study of the effects. And uh, he found it did have effects uh, on uh, knowledge, on attitudes, and on behavior, less on behavior than on knowledge, as you would expect, uh, seemingly in part from the attractiveness of the message, uh, the subtle nature of the message, uh, the educational message, and uh, repeated exposure. I guess if we hear anything often enough, it begins to make us uh, perhaps at least consider that point of view. Uh, so uh, my first point was one reason for optimism was uh, the new technologies which uh, unfreeze some frozen situations potentially. Uh, second factor is uh, with a few exceptions at least, we have some promising content. I've given some examples of that. These are rare. These are. Uh, a few bright spots among uh, a lot of I Love Lucy and Kojak and Mission Impossible. Uh, but it suggests to us some examples of what can be done. And then uh, thirdly, and I come to a point that will be uh, very dear uh, to uh, Mike, is that of uh, indigenous communication. Uh, C-Card, of course, is uh, the world center in uh, this perspective. Uh, it is, I think, uh, it and the work it does is helping us in some ways overcome the uh, sort of technological arrogance of, um, of uh, those of us, I include myself, who thought that uh, we knew more than they did 
uh, and that what they knew, like that farmer in Collins, uh, was wrong and what we knew was uh, right, and they were not so smart because it took them a while to figure out years, in fact, uh, what we knew to be the right thing uh, for them. Certainly, the indigenous knowledge uh, movement is at an early stage. I mean, I'm sure you can't believe that here at Iowa State, where everybody I meet seems to be spouting indigenous knowledge. Uh, but uh, the rest of the world uh, has not yet absorbed this message very fully, and uh, they have a long ways to go. Uh, in any event, uh, one piece of indigenous knowledge perspective that's very important to uh, scholars like myself is that of indigenous channels. There's not only indigenous content, but indigenous channels, obviously. And uh, generally, we have uh, not paid much attention to them in development uh, programs. Uh, and sometimes we have been surprised, as in the case of other kinds of indigenous knowledge, when they turn, up, turn out to be spectacularly uh, important. Um, I'll just use some examples uh, to illustrate what I mean. Uh, some years ago, in the early 70s, uh, I did uh, research on uh, TBAs. I don't know if you know what TBAs are. Uh, traditional birth attendants, the name, of course, says a lot. That's a Western name. Uh, in uh, different cultures, they are called terms that usually implies a great deal of respect and uh, endearment. Almost always, these TBAs are um, older women past 45 years of age. Usually they are widows, or yes, usually, usually they are widows. Uh, they're usually women, and they're usually widows. Uh, so, for instance, in Bahasa, Indonesia, they're called dukuns. In India, in Hindi, they're called dai. Uh, in uh, Spanish, in Mexico, for instance, they're called parteras, those who give birth, those who help give birth. And uh, <clears throat> they're usually very highly respected. Well, attempts were made in all of these countries that I've just mentioned, and many more, in the uh, early 70s uh, to um, recruit these uh, traditional birth attendants uh, to family planning. You can easily imagine the conflict of interest that that would represent uh, because uh, traditional birth attendants uh, are everywhere paid on the basis of births that they deliver. Well, uh, the last thing in the world that a uh, traditional birth attendant would want to do is to discourage the number of births by promoting family planning. Uh, but uh, in this case, um, uh, governments uh, national family planning programs and health uh, programs in uh, a number of countries uh, pioneered in doing something that uh, the medical establishment considered as completely crazy and very dangerous, and uh, that is uh, they uh, recruited uh, dacoons, dyes, parteras to uh, short training courses, usually about a, a, about a week, sometimes two weeks, sometimes two days. Uh, and the traditional birth attendants were um, um, asked for a lot of advice. They were typically also given some training, uh, which they usually gave each other through role playing, uh, in which they uh, made deliveries and uh, taught each other uh, what they knew. And uh, usually there would be a female doctor present, a, a, um, an expert in these matters, who. Uh, then also showed them uh, the importance of some things that they didn't know and didn't use, uh, such as the importance of uh, sterilizing the instrument that they used to uh, cut the cord uh, and so on. The net result of this is more babies living. Uh, also, the Dacoons were, uh, Dacoons, Dyes, Parteras, were asked to uh, promote family planning or at least to uh, provide information about it and referrals uh, two women who asked them for advice. And, and we had found, in an earlier study that we had done in India and in Indonesia, that the uh, traditional birth attendants were uh, commonly asked, they were the most common source of advice, interpersonal advice, about family planning, uh, understandably. Uh, the Dukuns were also given a delivery kit, sort of a Red Cross kind of kit, uh, with uh, uh, a um, disinfectant and uh, with uh, a um, razor blade to cut the cord and uh, with uh, some other things that they needed to uh, deliver births. And uh, they were usually very proud of these kits and they used them, our studies uh, showed. Uh, there was great controversy about one part of the kit 
and that is whether a forceps should be uh, also provided. Uh, some percent of all births in these settings require the use of uh, forceps. Uh, there was great fear about what uh, the pr traditional birth attendants might do with the forceps uh, in damaging the skulls of the uh, babies. And uh, so uh, ultimately on that one the doctors won and there are no forceps in any of the kits of the traditional birth attendants. Uh, that wasn't based on any uh, evidence, it was just based on the certainty of medical knowledge that uh, traditional birth attendants couldn't be trusted with uh, forceps. Uh, of course, they can buy them in uh, a drugstore if they want, want them bad enough, and some did, our study found. Uh, in any event, there's an example of an indigenous channel. Uh, it also represents, of course, a kind of indigenous knowledge. It also represents a kind of merger of the indigenous channel and knowledge uh, with modern <coughs> knowledge. And there were a lot of controversies, the forceps controversy just being one of them. Uh, but uh, our evaluation studies uh, showed that there was uh, a lot of benefit uh, in terms of uh, babies not dying at birth and mothers living who otherwise probably would not have. Uh, so uh, it seems to be a mild success. That's quite a change from uh, the Dutch colonial policy in Indonesia uh, when the Dutch government was there of uh, eliminating the, uh, the uh, Dukuns. Uh, the uh, American government had the same policy and used the same words, actually, uh, eliminate uh, the traditional birth attendants in the Philippines when we had something to say about the government of the Philippines. Uh, so we've come a long way. Uh, some other examples of indigenous channels, uh, just to move along, uh, are, for instance, uh, in sudden changes in government, one way or the other, changes in government, uh, the role that uh, sort of the little media and the traditional media play begin with a, a sort of a surprising thing. At the time of the fall of the Shah, the Iranian Revolution in 1979, um, the Inayatullah Khomeini uh, was organizing street demonstrations in Tehran of uh, up to three million people. Now, if you've ever uh, tried to organize Visha at Iowa State, you can imagine that uh, getting three million people in orderly processions, these were very orderly, very disciplined, uh, street demonstrations, uh, and the Inayatola was living in the south of France, in the Riviera at this time. Uh, he had moved there, and this is a clue as to how he did it, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia because he could have direct dial telephone service to his followers in, uh, in Iran. Uh, direct dial is very important if you have a Shah and a secret service, 